Welcome to the On Stage Podcast, where we deep dive into the power of music and entertainment. I need some questions answered, and I need them answered right now. Don't count on it. Can we talk about me now? Or what's I? So let's just have a conversation. Your voice don't ever hit me again. You better do a good job of it. Looks like you're gonna have to skip the prom. I'll think about that. You think about me at the prom with a lizard. I think you're exaggerating. Hi, Denise. How are you getting on? Nothing extra. <laughs> Too pretty? No, she's trouble. Jennifer, you hear me? Leave my father out of this. I'm smart and your daddy was dumb like you. You say you want to take me away from all this? <laughs> How soon? You're a great day. Well, maybe I can interest you in a midnight snack. And I've lost trust somewhere. You know, like maybe I left it in a hotel room, didn't do the idiot check on my life in a few too many cities, and then bam, it's gone. We're gonna try real hard, huh, Mom? Mm -hmm. Can you give me a little time for all this to soak in? You got it. I'm having such a good time. No one here knows I used to be fat. What do you think? Huh? How long do you think you, you can have? Oh, I have as much time as you need. Okay, so five hours? Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Awesome. awesome. Well, this is great, everyone. Look who we have on our platform. Good evening, Brace yourself for a journey into the heart of Hollywood as we welcome a Hollywood star who has graced both the big and small screens with her talent. She's originally from San Bernardino, California. Our guest today is none other than the radiant Tony Hudson. Oh, thank you, Christopher. Lovely to be here, truly. Thank yeah. you so much. My so Tony's, Tony's illustrious career spent decades with memorable roles in films like Places in the Heart, just one of yes. the guys, and more recently, Charlie's Christmas Wish, which was good, by the way. Oh, I'm glad her, you liked it. And her performances have not only entertained us, but have also touched our hearts and made us think. But Tony's journey is not just about her roles on the screen. Off screen, she has experienced a roller coaster of life, from being married to Judd Tyler Mintz, Dirk Benedict, my favorite, and Peter S. Rizal, to being a mother of three. Each chapter of her life adds a unique layer to her persona, making her the captivating individual she is today. So <laughs> sit back, relax, and join us. We delve into the life and career of the remarkable Tony Hudson. Let's give a warm welcome to Tony. Hello, Tony. Oh, hello. Thank you for having me, Christopher. Truly, it's it's nice, and I'm and I'm glad that you reached out. Yeah, you're very welcome. So I want to want to get into your. Key wrecked living. How have you been these days? How is the weather? The weather in life is stormy sometimes. Exactly. <laughs> I know exactly what you mean. Talk about yeah. stormy, everyone. There's this excellent book called Tender Love. Oh. Collection of sexy diary stories by Tony Hudson herself. I picked one up and you should too. I read it. Very interesting. There's one here by Stephen in Cabo. Yes, yeah, Stephen in Cabo. What do you think about that one? I love it, actually. I think it's, it's excellent. Hey, neighbor. You know, I love that <laughs> one. By Brando. Oh, and, Brando, yes. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Look at this. And then Stan, not quite the man. I read them all. You should get this. I'll put the link down below. You can pick it up at Amazon or Indigo, wherever. But Thank it's you. A small little book, but it's actually worth the read. And I'm actually, I was just like straddling Brad. Okay, I'm not going to want to read. You guys have to read that one, straddling Brad. Okay, that's all we're going to say. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tinder Love, Collection of Sexy Diary Stories by Tony Hudson. Get really good. Yeah. 
Yeah, a collection of dates uh, that I experienced while dating on Tinder and, you know, didn't know I was going to write a book about it. But as I dated, you know, I, I, I would like the, make these little voice memo memories about the date for like a minute long. I would just talk into my phone and say, OK, I went with Brando to this place and we did that. And and I because I was trying to find out who I was as a single woman in my 50s. And so I started dating to find out who I was and how I ranked. <laughs> and I, I found out that I was pretty much top shelf, gave me confidence. And, uh, and then I remembered that I have these voice memos and I, I listened to them to, to remember. And then I said, you know, I, I got to put these in a book and write them well. And I, and I hope I did. Well, they're written very well. One with Chris Loving on his Let's see. Okay, that's uh, a <laughs> cat in there, everyone. Uh, <laughs> what is your motivation, Tony, for writing this book? I know that there's like eHarmony, this Lava Life, all those other ones you could have tried, but why Tinder? Well, I was on a couple of uh, dating sites when I first started dating. And uh, Tinder, I got a lot of activity. That was the most activity that uh, I had in reference to connecting with a lot of different people. Um, so... I really did look at it to learn about myself because I was married back to back for 30 years, twice, and then had three kids. And so doing the motherhood thing and married, and now I find myself single, I didn't, it was like I, I didn't know how to date anymore. So mm -hmm. someone convinced me to go on Tinder and I was on Match.com, I was on Bumble for a minute. And I didn't like Bumble and Match was, the people were too boring. But Tinder, I, I was interesting. There was all ages, <clears throat> all reasons for being on there. <laughs> and uh, I found a lot about myself and about love, that everybody wants to be loved and respected and heard and seen. And so I wrote it to take back my sexuality. I was abused sexually as a kid mm. growing up. So we girls can have issues over that. Uh, over our lives. And so it really empowered me to take the step to go out and date, to learn about myself, and then to write about it. And I think, you know, it is erotica, but I actually think it's more romantica. I think it's just as romantic as it is sexy. And um, I think it's a really good conversation piece for couples. If they were to read the book together, um, you know, talk about it because people, the sexuality can have a lot of layers and issues for people. And I think it just having an open conversation with your partner is really, really healthy. Yeah, I can, I can, you know, I can understand that. I was reading a date three, Chris tattoo armor and yes. how he was too expert lean and ripped. Okay. That's for girls out there. Okay. <laughs> so I know that a lot. People like we had um, an actor by the name of Robert Lasardo on our program, and his body is covered in 85 to 90 percent of tattoos. Mm -hmm. And every tattoo tells a story. And I'm pretty sure that since he had tattoos all over his body, I know that sometimes people will put on a tattoo to hide a scar, like a physical scar, but they also hide uh, emotional scars as well. And e each scar and each tattoo tells a story. Yes. Yes, no, I agree. And that is actually the actual per pertinent story to Chris. He had had so many surgeries on his back and had a lot of scars and a lot of emotional scars. And he's a single mm -hmm. dad. And so he got a lot of tattoos to cover the scars and his emotional wounds were still there. They, they had not gotten taken care of with the tattoos, but it was his uh, new persona and uh, very, very athletic, but ill. He, he, his phys he physically wasn't well. And so um, it was a different kind of experience to go on a first date with somebody, you know, and they're so emotionally raw. And, and then he shared that. And it was, it was quite beautiful. And do you think that you being in his presence and in his life might have helped him emotionally get over these damages that he went through, especially through the medicinal marijuana that he wanted to share with you as well. <laughs> well no wonder you you're know, a good actress. <laughs> well, when you're a little bit older and, and menopause happens, sometimes you need help sleeping. 
And he was younger than me. So he shared with me, you know, try some of this. It might help you sleep. So it did. <laughs> yeah, it was a perfect story. The next story I liked is the one with um, Stephen. Yes. Uh, yeah. I, you know, Tony, I love this book. And I know a few people that I actually, I had someone taking care of my cat and they found it and they was they're upset with me. He said, why are you reading this book? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, well, that's, I had to tell them, listen, I have an actress and this is her book. And I usually buy their books and read them. And, you know, and so, but yeah, I tried Tinder and it just wasn't successful, but I'm glad no. it worked for you. <laughs> yes, it did. It did. It did. And, and uh, yeah, Stephen, Stephen is, is actually my boyfriend right now. Secret for you. And how's that working out for you? It's great. And it's lovely. And uh, we changed his name for the story, of course. All right. So these aren't really their names, obviously. No, they're close or tongue in cheek, a reason why I chose the name. <clears throat> or, yeah, there's secrets why I chose the names. I did change the guy's names. and But the situation and how I describe who they are as men and what their situation was or how they felt and all that all stuff was real. What we basically where we went or what we did. And then of course I creatively made the dates fabulous because we know that not every date is fabulous. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you about, you wrote for Stephen. It says morning sunrise highlights my blue velvet perch in a whole new way. I joined him on his velvet settee. Morning coffee conversation, have naked, half dressed, talk, 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 share, 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 laugh, 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 easy. Sounds like there's a Nelly Furtado song that actually has that sort of thing. And it's a, There you I, go. I, maybe I should make that into a song. There you go. Yeah, I thought of Nelly Furtado when I read that. And sure. But it's, it's full of good stories. I mean, I used to watch, um, you know, a lot of soap operas when I was growing up, and I, I read a lot of Harlequin novels, but... Because of my experience on Tinder, I just, you know, I, I, you know, swiping left, swiping right and all this. And and basically they say that if the person swipes on the same one that you swipe on, then you make a connection and it's yes. instant. But for me, I'm sitting there watching this thing turn and turn, waiting for, and I'm like, okay, where is she? Four or five hours later, it was still searching. And I'm like, why am I so unlucky? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I do know. I do know that uh, how one sets up a profile on uh, online dating sites is very important. It's very, very reflective of who you are and what you want to attract. And I did get a lot of responses about my my profile that they it, they said it was different and unique. And I didn't write a lot. I didn't say what I was looking for. I said I am a creative. I am a health freak. I am, you know, I just said who I am and, and I didn't say what I was looking for and what I want. I'm looking for a long time partner. I didn't No, I just said who I am and that was it. And, and some great photos, of course, the best, the best photos, but not yes. just, not just far away on a mountain with an animal, you know, and sunglasses and a hat, like, and then showing, you know, physical fitness. And I, yeah, it's like your pro profile is important. I'd be interested in knowing who is the one you're hugging on this. Is he actually mentioned in the book somewhere that, that who that guy is you're hugging? Or is that you're hugging a dog or? No, what I'm hugging is the, is the duvet. That is a down filled oh. duvet with cotton sheets on it. And I am in bed. And actually that picture is me. And it's uh, Stephen took that picture. It's awesome. Well, everyone, this is available on Amazon or where all books are sold, Tinder Love. I would suggest you get it, but be prepared, you know. And, <laughs> and whether you go on Tinder or not, yeah, it is sexy. It's very sexy. Now that we got that part of the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask you, so now we know you're a talented actress who has played various roles in movies. Um, your most notable one is 1982 Young Doctors in Love, where you played the character Bunny. Can you explain to me how you felt when you first got into that 
one? Well, that Young Doctors in Love was my very first film. And it, so it was mm -hmm. a small role. And I played a candy striper, Gary Marshall, the director of Pretty Woman and a very, a lot of wonderful movies. Uh, he, it was his directorial debut, Young Doctors in Love. It was Jerry Bruckheimer, the producer, uh, his, one of his first movies that he produced. So Gary Marshall and Jerry Bruckheimer together. There were 72 speaking parts. You had Michael McKeon, Sean Young, Dabney Coleman, uh, Michael Richards. You had so many, you had a huge cast. And I was a candy striper. And I was originally hired for three days and I worked for 13 weeks because Gary Marshall was still writing the movie as we were shooting it. So he would come in with new pages. There'd be a main scene, but he'd have the candy stripers tap dancing in with a gurney at the beginning of the scene to see what happened. And then we'd tap dance out at the end of the scene with the gurney. And it was these little slapstick kind of things. So <clears throat> that experience working for Gary Marshall created a lifelong relationship and friendship. He gave me away when I got married once. He's like a surrogate mm -hmm. dad to me. I didn't have a, a father really growing up and a lot of stepdads. And so the fact that he took me under his wing, I was 19 years old when I did that movie, right after the commercial, the Taylor Swift thing, I did that movie. So it, boom, boom. And uh, yeah, so Young Doctors in Love was an entree into how to be a professional actor. And it, I was very blessed to have Gary as my director. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about that Taylor Swift commercial, how we're thinking it was, uh, it was um, the other girl. What did I mention? Her name was Zena, I think her name was. And then you told Zena me. Zena LaVey, who was Anton LaVey's LaVey. daughter. Mm -hmm. And it was you, actually. Yes, yes, it's me, and, and it's gone viral. It's quite cute. I mean, I was 19, did this commercial that I did for like three years running and uh, about four spots a year and some radio spots. And who knew that, you know, 50 years later <laughs> or 30 years, wait, here we are, and people think that it's Taylor Swift as a time traveler. In yeah, the I know. Gals, in the Glamour Gals commercial that I did in 1981. So, uh, yeah, that's kind of brought up a lot of new interest. It's, it's quite fun. Well, I know there's a photo of you and Taylor Swift together. Do you, do you ever think that that's what you're going to look like? Like, ta sorry, Taylor Swift, does she think that's what she's going to look like when she's your age? <laughs> oh, wouldn't that be nice if she thought that would be a good thing? <laughs> because I, I thought it was like this. That's right. It, it could be Taylor Swift. No, really? What? <laughs> oh, that's Tina LaVey. No. <laughs> yes, and, we... all the com and all the conversation uh, comments yeah. have been they Zena LaVey, or there's a girl named Ashley, I guess, who pretends to be Taylor. And they so people thought it was Ashley. They thought it was Taylor's mom. They, you know. And then some people knew it was me. They go, no, that's Tony Hudson from Just One of the Guys. That's her. <laughs> Yeah, but you still had that uh, that video out there still going viral and nobody's putting an end to it saying, you know, that's uh, that's Taylor Swift time travel. No, he just said it was Tony Hudson. Oh, that's Taylor Swift time travel. We just told you who, you know, it's so yeah. like, kind of silly, but do you have proof it was you, you know, like that? <laughs> so what movie did you really appreciate? Like besides Young Doctors in Love, you were in Cross Creek, Places in the Heart, Prime Risk. I'm noticing that you were in Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre in 1990. Some yes. of the things that you had to be told to do and and what the whole movie is about. Like, how did that make you feel that, that you had to be one of the, the um, victims in that movie? Well, I am not a huge horror fan of, I mean, it's not my genre of film that I love to watch. Of course, as a professional actor, you take work that interests you. Um, I was pregnant with my second child at the time. So working as an actor for me in my real near future, I was in my first trimester, not showing, of course, mm -hmm. but I knew I was soon not going to work <clears throat> for a while being pregnant. So when this opportunity came up and it was a short shoot duration and I'm not showing and I went, ah, I'd like to, I'd like to get another film in before I go to motherhood again. So I went on the audition and killed it. Uh, just nailed the audition and he hired me and I worked, you know, it was probably a week's work out in the woods, out by Magic Mountain there in the desert, running from Leatherface. 
Uh, but when we were about to shoot the scene where I do get chainsawed in half by Leatherface after I saved the lead people for a minute, um, I actually told the director I was pregnant just in case like something happened. I just wanted him to know, you know, just, I don't know. And he, he was like, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? You're telling me this now? And I said, yes. But anyway, it was, everything was fine and it was good, but. <laughs> Why was there quite a, a gap between Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3, 1990 and Cahoots 2001? That's like an 11 year stretch. What was going on between that time? Um, a lot of uh, personal divorce and relationship challenges and things, you know, that just kept me in motherhood, of course, because I had a child. And then the next movie you got after that was from Cahoots. You went out of these rooms and in Nessie and Me. So, I mean, then you ended up just recently Charlie's Christmas Wish. Now, we had the pandemic. And how did the pandemic affect you? emotionally, spiritually, physically, what kind of? Well, let me touch on Charlie's Christmas wish first, because I had moved to Georgia after one of my marriages fell out and, and they moved to Ohio and Georgia was closer to Ohio. And my producing partner was living in Georgia and we were about to shoot Charlie's Christmas wish of which I'm a producer and the lead actress, and my son, Walker, plays the lead son. My uh, oldest son plays the manager of the bakery. The dog, Charlie's my dog. I trained it. I did the dog handling. I did the set designing. I mean, it was hands-on, ground floor, guerrilla filmmaking, and with my partner. And we, we produced our first movie. And so that was right before COVID, then COVID. So we did a lot of reshoots and editing during COVID. And... Um, being alone in Georgia and not living outside of, <clears throat> excuse me, California my whole life basically, uh, was unique. And so during that time, I was very alone. I spent a lot of alone time in a cute little cottage uh, in Canton, Georgia, where we shot the movie. And uh, it's a family, you know, rated, rated G. It's not even PG. It's rated G. So everybody can watch Charlie's Christmas Wish. And it's a, a homeless veteran themed movie as well. So Every Labor Day and Christmas, it comes out, and it, and it just did. So, um, yeah, the, the COVID situation, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an alternative eater. I've been eating healthy since I was 19, 20 years old. Dirk Benedict, my ex-husband from the 18, cured himself of prostate cancer and taught me how to eat healthy. And mm. so when it came time for the COVID thing, I didn't go for any shots. <laughs> I, I didn't even vaccinate my children. I don't believe in it. So I breastfed them. I made their baby food. I cook mostly all my own food. I don't eat meat. I don't eat much dairy. I don't eat any sugar. And I've been doing that a long time, a long, long time. I raised all my kids that way, breastfed them. And that's, that's the way I work. I'm a holistic, all natural girl. That's interesting. I love the fact about that key wrecked living. Now it's an audio book about your story of self-discovery told through your relationship with food. And then it's a TV series in 2020, and it's a testament to your versatility as you step into the shoes of a producer. What is it about this that, like, I know I read when uh, Dirk Benedict, your husband, ex-husband back then, um, he had cancer. I know about his cancer. He read about it. Yep. How did he exactly heal himself? Was it through keto? Was it high fat, low carb diet? Was it um, carnivore diet, which people say that a life just eating meat will heal you from all these different things? Well, let me share it with you. That's a good question, Chris, because uh, it's he was raised. Okay, Dirk Benick was raised in Montana. Montana is wild meat, venison, elk. Like they hunted, so they he ate meat in every single meal: breakfast, lunch, dinner. There was meat. So by the time he was a young person, we're talking 18, 19, 20, 21, football player, basketball player, that kind of thing, he had such arthritis. It took him 30 minutes to get his body going in the wow. morning. And then he went to college, continued you know, his regular Montana eating lifestyle, but would come home in summers to work on the ranch and stuff. 
But then he got a movie, started doing his acting. And while he was in uh, Sweden doing a movie, I think it was called Georgia, Georgia, actually. I think. But he met a crew member, this African-American, thin, ripped dude sitting in the corner with a little bowl eating every lunch on set. They would film, and then at lunchtime, everybody would go eat the regular food, and this guy would sit over there. And, and they had a conversation. And the gentleman told him <clears throat> that he stopped eating uh, meat. He doesn't eat meat and this, and he suggested to Dirk to stop. And so he did. Actually, just while he was shooting, he just stopped eating meat. And it took about seven days, and he could get out of bed. There was no more. He stopped the meat completely and then took it further when he came home from shooting that movie. Uh, then he started having prostate issues because now his body's trying to clean out all the meat. And so he had the prostate issue. There was blood and clots, clobs of stuff. And he went to the doctor and he said, oh, yeah, your prostate's very bad. We need to roto-rooter you right now. Like they gave him the papers to sign to go in and he ran out of the hospital. And the person that was with him when he went to the hospital was a man named William Dufty. And he wrote a book called Sugar Blues. And he wrote many other books, but he was married to Gloria Swanson, who was also eating the same way that Dirk's eating. And so he learned from Gloria Swanson, the silent film star, and her husband, William Dufty, the author, about macrobiotics. Mm. Macrobiotics is based on Eastern philosophy. It's a balance of yin and yang. It's a balance of sodium, potassium, sodium, potassium, acid, alkaline. And it has to do with nature. It's not calories. It's not grams. It's not fats and carbs it's balance of sodium potassium acid alkaline and the u.s diet is extremely acidic and extremely empty of any nutritional value if you go to the grocery store and you look at the shelves between your nose and your knees that's all the junk if you want the healthier items you have to go way up high or way down below where they have one or two selections of a healthier item and what's interesting, I love, I saw somebody on a little video the other day that said, well, if in a store, a grocery store, let's say, that there's a health food section, what's all the rest of the food? Well, that's why we have Whole Foods stores here, but they're so expensive. No, Whole Foods has changed. When Whole Foods was Whole Foods, um, but now it's Amazon, so it's a little bit different. Like, I've been eating this way. I call it correct living because uh, I just believe that macrobiotics is a word that people don't understand. Macro means whole, biotic means life. So it's eating things in their whole form, things that have just grown out of the ground as soon as possible, not processed, not gone through homogenization, pasteurization, all that stuff, and added, you know, all the, all the junk. So I eat clean and that's, correct living and i and i just really believe that people can cure themselves of everything medicine food is medicine medicine can never be food yeah, i know this youtube channel called homestead how and he was obese overweight he had cancer health problems and then suddenly he became a carnivore and he was eating meat that's all he ate was meat and he healed himself from cancer so how come dirk eating all that meat then heal him, but this guy gets healed by eating meat. So I don't understand the difference. Like That's why some- good Very good question. It's about balance. So every one of us is unique and, and, and different. So to say this is what you need to eat in the morning and the afternoon for you and me would be different because we're different people. We're made, you, the egg and the sperm that created you is different than the egg and the sperm that created me. Then we're lodged in the mother's womb. She eats what she eats for nine, 10 months, right? Now that creates who you are as a baby. So your unique beginning is different than my unique beginning. So let's say that guy didn't eat healthy and he ate white bread and sugar and chips and hot, you know, the, the, the process, maybe that was his life, right? And then he goes, all right, I'm going to go carnivore. And his body goes, what? And he heals himself. Well, mm -hmm. that's because his body was out of alignment in that way. There is reasons to eat meat if you're anemic you know let's say if you're totally anemic and you have no iron in you and you need then you should and if it's winter time and it's cold then having a little bit of meat might be very healthy for you but as a daily as a every meal for me no 
No, it doesn't work for me. Uh, I eat fish. Uh, once a year, I might have an organically kosher baked, you know, turkey at Thanksgiving because, you know, some of my other friends like it and I'll cook a turkey. But I'm, in other words, I'm not opposed to it. I just stay away from it. I stay, I, I'm a plant-based girl. And I eat a lot of sea vegetables, which is very unique, and a lot of fermented foods, which is then alkaline, right? So his body reacting by eating meat is because it just, he's, here's what his body reacts to, I believe, more than the meat was everything he stopped eating. It wasn't the meat that cured him. It was the shit he stopped eating. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I was at uh, Christmas at my brother's place, and my brother's a nurse, so he has like this portable blood pressure monitor. So he said, Chris, I want to test your blood pressure. My blood pressure was like 56 over whatever. So he was like, oh, that's bad. Oh, you got to go. So... Uh, sorry, not 56, 156. So I, I went to the hospital and I, I went on a keto diet sure, and yeah. I lost 34 pounds. I got rid of <laughs> sugar and I feel great. And my blood pressure is low. Do you believe that it's the sugar that causes, like, I know I heard that um, sugar feeds cancer. And if you totally wipe uh, sugar from your diet, cancer will shrink. You'll, you'll, get you get healed like there's no yes, i totally believe the 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 standard american diet that they try to the raise us all on you know the food pyramid uh totally wrong and <laughs> so yeah not 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 a good thing but i believe that uh it's about creating good blood and you can you can create new blood in your body every seven eight years you could become a whole new person by just what you eat Right. So it's just a choice. It's a choice to be able to ask your question again, because I lost I lost the train of thought. I did. Well, I was in a lot of um, processed foods, sugar and oh, the sugar cancer question. That's what you had. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I believe that um, sugar is the, one of the biggest culprits. Sugar, along with all the chemicals and preservatives and dyes and all the things that they make it last longer and look pretty and all of that. Uh, it's just, it's poison. It's poison. You, we need to cook our own foods. You cannot rely on restaurants unless you know for sure that they're getting organically grown food. Otherwise you're getting modified corns. If you go to, you know, any normal big brand name restaurant and the food is very, very low quality unless you know the source of where they're buying their foods. Cause everyone uses the same distributors. Yeah. I mean, well, it was so sort of like I discovered, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Eric Berg. He's a YouTube channel and it was a video called Poison of Sugar. And he discusses the sugar in the industry and how it feeds cancer. And he interviewed. It's fertilizer. Uh, sugar is well, he, fertilizer. He interviewed a 24 year old who had uh, stage four colon cancer and his tumor was like that big. And so he didn't go on chemo. What he did is he started going on a keto diet and got rid of sugar and at what? Two, he's like two months to live, seven, eight years later, he's still alive. So that, that's not an unusual story in my world because I, I, since I was 19, I changed my way of eating. And so with Dirk, when we were married, he wrote his book, Confessions of a Kamikaze Cowboy, which tells his story of curing himself of prostate cancer, a little bit of what I shared with you here today. And so we would, we would go around and he would be speaking about his book but then I would become part of the conversation because they wanted to know, how did you get back into shape after eating? Why, how do you not feed your kids cake and ice cream at a kid's birthday party? How do you be a mother that way? How do you do that? And so that conversation starts uh, very early on. And my kids never knew sugar. In fact, I have a video, Chris, of my son, Walker, who's now just turned 19. And he was probably 10, 11. We're in a grocery store and we stop at the ding dong Twinkies aisle. <laughs> and I said, do you know what these are? And he said, no. And I said, you don't know what any of these are? You know, because we didn't go to those kind of, we went to Whole Foods or we went to the Mothers or Sprouts. We went to these other markets. We didn't go to, sorry, Ralph's, Vaughn's, all those stores. So we're in one of those because we're somewhere and we had to get something. And, and he's going, what are these? Because he sees friends who have had them. So we started talking about it. And I videotaped him. 
I said, do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? He says, nope, nope, never seen it. And so he didn't know any of those things, so he wasn't missing out on anything. He, you know, he had desserts and all these things, but I would make them. You know, I make a thing called Canton, which is like Jello, but it's made from fruit juice and seaweed and fruit. So it, it, there's there's an alternative healthy version for everything that you like. You just yeah, monk fruit is one of them. Yes, you gotta go, just go look for it. Yeah. Yeah. So this monk fruit healthy alternative, the stevia healthy alternative. You being on the keto. Healthier, the healthier alternatives are more brown rice syrup, molasses, barley malt, and maple syrup. All the other alternative cute things that they charge you a lot of money for in cute little bottles, stevia. Da, da, da. Just no. go to the the maple from a tree, not Aunt Jemima, where it's maple-like syrup. It's real syrup, and you know, or and honey's even more on the side of sugar. It, it leans more sugar. But if you go barley malt, maple syrup, brown rice syrup, which looks like a cloudy honey, very good quality sweetener. Yeah, it's kind of funny, but I would always take milk and sugar in my coffee, but I've been drinking black coffee for years. I've been having that bulletproof coffee, if you know what that's about. I've heard uh, about it, yeah. It's, it's black, so you get black coffee, you, put, you melt butter, coconut oil, turmeric, and cinnamon all in the, and it tastes really good. It tastes like a cappuccino, but it's really healthy for you. I lost so much weight. I was almost at 230, and now I'm at like 180 something. One, Congratulations and, for you, sir. That's, a lot of people never get, get around to it, so good for you. Yeah. So when I heard about your key wrecked living, I thought this is interesting. Have now, you... now, the, the way I pronounce it is just it's it's the phonetic spelling of the word correct. So if you were to look up the definition of the word correct, C-O-R-R-E-C-T, the way they spell it phonetically is the way I spell it on my book, K-E-R-E-K-T. So it's I thought correct the K -E, I thought the K-E was part of keto. That's what I thought keto wrecked. Nope. No, no okay. it's not keto at all. Not it's macrobiotics, but I call it correct living because I it's a consciously proactive preventative lifestyle. The way I live, I make my choices consciously. I eat healthy before I have an ailment. You know, um, I, I do it preventatively so that I'm not chasing after a cure. I just hopefully just don't get there and have anything. Right. So now that we know that. Um, your ex-husband Dirk Benedict, great, great actor. I, I love. He was Starbuck in Battlestar Galactic and all this, and and also he was Face in A Team. Mm -hmm. Now that he, now he's he's cured himself from cancer. He's reading. He's eating right. How come the relationship didn't last, or is it after you divorced him? Oh no, he cured himself of eating this way before I met him. Okay but wrote about it while we were together. He wrote the book while we were together and he shared with me his journey. And I had normal little ailments when I met him. I had acne and the emotional highs and lows that girls have on their menstrual cycle. Um, what else did I have? Maybe a little cellulite on my rear end. And I was complaining to him about it, you know, like, oh, I don't, yeah, I don't like those. And he goes, well, that's all the dairy and sugar you eat. And I went, what? And so he handed me a little pamphlet. It was very thin, a very little tiny pamphlet uh, called the, oh, what is it? Uh, it was basically the principles of the macrobiotic diet. And I read it through one night, and I, it, it changed my life. Totally. And think about it. I divorced the guy, and I'm still eating that way. So I didn't change my way of eating for him. <laughs> I changed for me. And it, and it works. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm 63, right? And three kids. And now I have twin granddaughters, London and Tobin, up in Montana. And so, yeah, it, it's, um, and my boys are all healthy, you know, and I, and I chose to, to do that for them. Yeah, yeah. you look great. I, I think you were like 50, 51. You look really good for your age. Thank you. And, Thank you. and, I, and I just got over a whole skin cancer thing on my face oh wow yeah so on oh my this, goodness oh. i was cut i was cut from two years ago so it's still healing but i was cut from here all the way over down all the way to here 
and they took my skin off because I had to take a hole of my skin right here. So I had to cover the hole. So they took it off and then covered the hole. But now there's a hole here. Oh, so wow. they took a piece off and put a graph. And so that's why it's a little discolored under here. And yeah, it's been quite a journey being an actor and having skin cancer on your face. I, I've, I've known about this uh, 102 year old doctor and she's still practicing. And this 105 year olds working out and they look great for their age, but they may not be eating properly. So you think it has something to do with genes? Or do you think maybe they always said, so tell me, miss, whatever. Um, you're 103 years old. What's the secret to longevity? And you'll just say, think, oh, I, I take one cigar and, and I drink white wine. And, and they really don't know why they're living so long, really, when you think of it. Well, I actually think that it's because the age of who they are and you go into their past, they weren't going to the McDonald's drive through they were eating cooked meals at home. Yeah. And so they, so they didn't have all the junk in them to then when they had the one cigar or the sip of wine that it would affect them so bad. But we're eating Jack in the Box, Burger King, McDonald's, KFC, Twinkies, Tikas, Cheetos, Coca-Cola, Slurpee, haagen -Dazs. You just keep going. It's called shite. <laughs> it's, not, it's not food. And it's stuffed and it tastes good because you're used to it. Yeah. The so only I reason have a I... Cleanse. I have a yeah. cleanse I take people through. It's a 30-day okay. cleanse. It's called a correct cleanse. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's seven to ten days eating brown rice, organically grown, short grain brown rice, every single day as much as you want, morning, lunch, and dinner. It's a cleanse. You're cleaning your colon. You're cleaning your liver. It's a whole grain. It's a complex carb. So you're getting everything the grain offers you. And it's like a broom. So it sweeps you out, cleans you out. But after that first seven to 10 days of brown rice and kukicha tea, which is an alkaline tea, one of the only teas that's alkaline, um, then you start eating steamed vegetables along with the rice for the next 20 days to continue your 30 days. So when you taste a carrot after eating brown rice for seven to 10 days, and you taste it, just a steamed carrot, no sauce, not sauteed, no oils, no salt and pepper, a steamed carrot, it's like candy. You're actually tasting the real food. It's so sweet, it's so wonderful. But we can't taste that carrot because we're so satiated with hot sauce and ketchup and, and the relish and the stuff. You don't even taste the food and it's not even food anyway, so. Well, that's why I severed my relationship with uh, fast food, especially McDonald's. So we had a coworker, and he talked about a time he took like a Big Mac, he put it in the back of a a drawer for a whole yeah. year, and he took it out, and wow, it looks like I just bought it. <laughs> right. It, it, so that tells it you. Rot. Yeah. Right. That's why when people, it's so interesting when they buy organic vegetables, mm -hmm. and they will go to take it out of the plastic bag that they, oh, I'm going to yeah. get this broccoli, and, put, and then they take it out and they see a little bug. And they get freaked out. But guess why the bug is there? Because it's organic. It's not been sprayed with pesticides and shit and junk. So you got to wash the vegetable. It's because it's been outside where bugs are growing. It doesn't mean it's nasty and dirty and not healthy. It means there's a bug on it. You got to wash it off. <laughs> but without bugs. And then all the fruits and vegetables that they're growing now with no seeds. See, that's genetically modifying the actual food. We need to eat the ones that have seeds in them because that's real. Yeah, that's interesting, Tony, because um, ever since I started this keto and, and learning how to eat properly and, and losing almost 40 pounds, I started eating kiwi fruit. I've never had kiwi fruit in my life. And I'm like, because it looks weird. It looks like this little, little small little miniature coconut with hair on them. Like, what is this? I ate it. I'm like, this is extra. I buy I buy kiwi now, I buy apples, um, and I, I feel really good, but I want to keep it up. I don't want to have to like, drink black coffee. I would never in my whole life ever thought I'd ever drink black coffee. I haven't had good milk in a couple of years. Yeah. Good for you for changing, because changing your perception and the paradigm, the paradigm in your mind of what's possible, what would possibly taste good. People always are surprised at the food that I make and how wonderful it is, because it's not your typical 
vegetarian or pescatarian meal that you would get, let's say, at a restaurant where it's not that healthy of a restaurant, but they have one dish on there that's vegetarian. It's like, oh, I'll try that. And it sucks because it's horrible. They're not a vegetarian restaurant. They don't know how to do it. So everybody gets, oh, I don't want that. But when you really know how, I mean, I make tacos that are just, mm, and, wow. and burgers and tuna mm -hmm. melts and all the things, but it's just the ingredients are organic and natural or wild caught or whatever it is. It's, it's the best it can be because guess what? I'm worth it. This rice you're talking about is not basmati rice, is it? No, it's organically grown short grain brown rice. Okay, I'll have to look for that. I'll have to look uh -huh. for that. I, I, I'm really, I don't want to put this out there, but I do struggle sometimes with constipation. And the only way to fix that is either eat eggs or drink water or kiwi. No, or apple. You, you eat brown rice, babe? There's, okay, there's the four F's. You want to know how you can tell if you're healthy is when you poop. So the four F's of, uh, wait, what is it? It's uh, a foot long, fawn colored, fluffy floater. <laughs> Should I change so, the name of my podcast called the poop podcast? <laughs> no, but it is, it is telling, it is telling of your insides. Right? If you're constipated, it tells you what's going on. If you've got diarrhea, it tells you what's going on. No, but yeah. You can't, you can't see in there. But brown rice, like I said earlier, it's a broom. And it, it will keep you regular. Keep you regular. Because fiber, to... and, it, and it's the whole grain. It's not, it's not white rice. See, it's just the inside of brown rice. They take the husk and the, all the, the psyllium and all that away, the nutrition. Okay. And then they give you the white rice. So just eat the brown rice. It's the whole thing. It's All right, I'll check. Like, yeah. It's kind of like oatmeal. You know, they oh, yeah. remember they used to put oat bran and everything? Mm -hmm. Like a muffin with added oat bran. Well, just eat the whole oat and you get the oat bran and the oat and all the all the minerals and vitamins that come from whole oats, which is okay. why eating oatmeal is great. See, so it's eating things in their whole form. Okay, I do eat oatmeal, but I put frozen blueberries in there. So that's it's a good. Fresh one. Fresh ones don't really last very long, but frozen blueberries, you can buy them, put them in the freezer, and they last for months, and you just take them out. And... So it works for me. It works for totally me. Totally perfect. Yeah, blueberries and oatmeal one of my favorites. Yeah, I noticed when you did this Correct Living TV series, you stepped in the shoes of a producer. Were there people that you worked with who considered adopting that Correct Living, that they're doing it today, or did they say, this is too much, I can't handle this anymore, I want my burgers back? Well, a lot of my uh, clients through my Correct Living business that I've helped take through the journey of a cleanse uh, have continued eating. Uh, and then, they, then they, they go wider again. You know, it's the, the 30 days is to kind of see, mm -hmm. see how you re-regulate re yourself. You know, so you get a little wider, maybe you're traveling and you're working and you're eating, you're going out to restaurants too much. And you go, oops, let's go back. Let's eat my miso soup. My oatmeal, my brown rice, my tempeh, my tofu, my seitan, my kale, my collards, my Swiss chard, my bok choy, all of that. You know, I remember going to a Denny's on a road trip once, and I got a, a bowl of cream of wheat and an English muffin. That was like the healthiest thing I could find at a Denny's. And then I saw in the salad bar that they were setting up, they had these big, giant, beautiful, hearty green leaves of kale that they were shoving in the ice as decoration around the bowls of jello fruit salad. And I said, can you take these big giant leaves of kale back into the kitchen and steam them for me? Because <laughs> they weren't serving them as food. They just had it as decoration. And that's one of the healthiest things you can eat is kale and collards and Swiss chard, way better than broccoli and spinach. Did you notice your, the, your cloudy mind clearing up that you're able to think straight and and also um, just fix a few other things that made you think this is working somehow. Yes. Yeah. It, 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 um, well, I grew up with a mother who was yo-yo dieting, you know, always hearing my mother and her girlfriends talking about trying to lose weight and the cottage cheese diet and the mm. Shackley this and the, and, and I told myself when I was younger, I didn't want to live like that. And I didn't know I told myself that until I, found out there was a way to change it. And then I went, ah, oh, and I grabbed onto it so fast. And I've been this way ever since. I 
just stopped. When I stopped, it was the acne went away. The cellulite of my ass went away. The emotional highs and lows went away of the roller coaster of female hormones. Uh, and much, yes, much more centered, not as anxious, not as worry wart. Yeah, a little more just balanced. When you were eating terribly, was there a thought and a threat and a feeling of unshakable that I'm going to die of cancer? Was death hovering over your head? No, not at all. No, not at all. It truly was not wanting to become my mother in the idea that you chase trying to fix something. Mm. Instead of just being. I just wanted to be. I didn't want to create a problem then try to fix the problem. I wanted to just never have the problem. So I, I chose a preventative path instead of waiting. I wasn't worried about getting it, but I was worried about chasing health. I just wanted to have health. So I just chose and when, I, when it made sense to me, because I'm a common sense intellect. I, I've never graduated high school, never went to college. I'm just a common sense girl. Live life, figure it out, right? And now I'm very well read and I'm very smart. I'm not insecure about it, but I learned through doing and it just made sense to me. So the common sense intellect of, yeah, you are what you eat. Mm -hmm. was, your, was your marriage to Dirk a happy one? For a good number of years, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. And we both had that in mind for our children. We had no qualm. He's the one who taught me how to eat that way. He was already cooking that way, so he taught me how to cook that way. And then, of course, I took over all the cooking and all the nurturing eventually. But uh, we were together 13 years and two kids. So, yeah. So what happened with Judd and Peter S. Rizzo? What's going uh, on? With well, oh, the, 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 the Peter S. Rizzo, that was, uh, I was legally married to him as a very, very, very young girl. And he was an older guy. And I got divorced. So I don't really feel like that was a marriage because... It happened out of a uh, personal family situation. It was weird. I never had any kids with him or anything. It was just a, it was a relationship when I was really young with an older guy. Just, they make movies out of that. Anyway, it ended. But Judd was after. So it was Peter, then Dirk, then Judd. Okay. And Judd was 17 years. And uh, in fact, I'm just finishing up, uh, tidying up all that legally in reference to ending it. Yeah, it's kind of a good thing. I'm going through that right now. But uh, we have a beautiful son, Walker, who's an actor, Walker Hudson Mintz. And, um, yeah, he's rocking it out here in California. And Judd's back in Ohio where he belongs. <laughs> but it's not like you have to discommunicate with them. Like, I mean, you're, you're still friends with Dirk, I believe. Oh, yes. Yeah, because yeah, you we're, had... friend, we're friends and we'll chat. I mean, once a year, twice a year, we'll chat for like an hour about the kids and things. And yeah, and then I'm when I go up to see them, I see them. Well, um, Tony, you said you were well read. Now, do you believe that a lot of the mental illnesses like uh, schizophrenia and um, any of those other ones could be actually helped by diet? Oh, absolutely. 100%. 100. Of course, someone could be too far gone in too many years that direction to reverse a situation. But I think if someone is young and they, someone's seeing a propensity for being a little off the charts in certain ways, you can definitely adjust the diet, but specific adjusting of the diet. Because I believe if you have a specific situation, you have to be specific about the cure. You can't just go, oh, I'll just stop eating a little bit of sugar. I won't eat it as much and yeah. expect these great things to happen. Right. You have to really make a change. That's the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. You can't do that. You've got to change things to get a change. That's interesting because that, because I know this woman, she had dementia and she was going on the way to, uh, you know, Alzheimer's. So they put her on a strict keto diet and six, seven months later, it's gone. She's back to her normal self. How do you explain that? It's because her body was in overload in one direction too much, mm. out of balance. It was That's out of balance. And like I said before about the other gentleman you referred to, it's, I believe truly when I've taken people through the cleanse, it's not that they're eating brown rice for seven to 10 days and then for 30 days adding the vegetables and fruits as the, as the days go on. 
that made them feel better. It's what they stopped eating. It's the white bread and the shit and the junk that they keep eating every day to try this cleanse or diet that helps them. It's not the new thing so much. It is. But it's not the new thing they're eating that's doing it. It's not like a magic pill, like a magic food. It's the, the stuff they were eating for 20, 30, 40, 50 years that they're made up of. And then they stop that. That's what their body's going, yippee! That's what the body's going, yippee. It's like a heroin addict. Think of it this way. If I was a heroin addict, okay, shooting up every day. Mm-hmm. And then I said, you know, I'm just going to cut back once a day. That's it. Am I still a heroin addict? Yeah, I'm still a heroin addict. So you can't say I'm going to cut back and think my body's free of sugar now. You're 40 years of sugar or 50, however old you are, yeah. full of sugar. You can't for one week not eat sugar and expect, woohoo, miracles. So it's really what people stop eating that gives the most effect. Because I've heard a lot of people that go on the carnivore diet that they get a really good result right away, and then they plateau. And then it's not so good because they're not getting a well-rounded diet. They got the Mm. good change and shift that they wanted, but now it's not balanced. It's too extreme yang, like yin and yang. It's too yang. It's too animal. Because the extreme is is what you want to stay away from. So extreme yang is meat, dairy, eggs, and then yin is sugar, vinegar, white wine, drugs, medicine. Right. So if you eat a steak, you want ice cream because it's the, it's the opposite. You crave the sugar. But if you eat brown rice, millet, quinoa, carrots, squashes, and it's in the middle. So now you're going like this instead of like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I asked another guest if they were big Greta th- Thunberg fan, and they said that they were a vegan for a reason. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, uh, you know, global warming and the way the planet is and stopping? It doesn't exist. Foods? Global warming doesn't exist. It's okay. a, it's a, it's a, it's a hoax, and it's to get us to follow the rules that they're going to try and implement now, which is to have us eat lab-grown meat, fake stuff, yeah. genetically modified foods, uh, fruits with appeal. All the things that they're trying to do to tell us that it, you know, it's for global warming. There is no global warming. I mean, what? Thirty years ago, they said California was going to be in the ocean. Twenty years ago, they said. I mean, it, it's never changed, and it's it's no. And there's plenty of room for people. And the cows are not farting and burping and making the climate horrible. It's just ridiculous. I'm sorry. Don't believe it. Uh, I believe in recycling. <laughs> I believe in, uh, you know, eating healthy and helping other people eat healthy. I believe in uh, cleaning up your own environment, taking care of your house and your your area. And yeah, but no, don't believe in it. Sorry. Well, the one thing about the pandemic is I noticed that excess amount of vinyl gloves were thrown on the ground without throwing them in the garbage. All around was just vinyl gloves everywhere. You know, you had to wear those gloves. They just threw them. I mean, if they care about the planet, they would have put them in the garbage. Because I worked in a factory years ago where we made these final gloves. And they don't decompose. That I know. So it's yeah, terrible. I understand. But it's, yeah, and they are making things that are not good for the planet. But it's not, the planet is not on the, 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 the mm-hmm. it's not about to implode itself. Sorry. It, we're, there's just too much wonderful, uh, nurturing, natural elements that we live with daily i mean they're spraying the skies with chemtrails right if anybody still think that's mist coming out of the tail end of a jet as it's flying you got another thing coming so they're spraying the air they're killing the food you know they're telling you that the climate's bad so you're going to eat bugs you know come on i'm sorry i'm not going to eat a cricket but there's some to cultures save, to save the climate. Food. No, I will grow my own food and and uh, make my own almond milk as I do. And I have a Zojirushi rice cooker. I have brown rice hot available 24 seven in my home. Right mm. now, my Zojirushi rice cooker is in the back kitchen, plugged in, and it keeps it warm for 96 hours. Cook it, and then you just 
put the rice into whatever saute, whatever thing, and it's just always available. So, yeah, healthy lifestyle is where it's at. And, you know, they want to not make healthy vitamins legal. They want to they, they get rid of them, and they want to get rid of gardens, and they're trying to get rid of they're, – they're burning up the chicken farms. and the So they're making it really difficult for us. So that's why we need to become awake to what's really going on and be responsible for ourselves and not say that other people need to be responsible for our health. We need to be responsible for our health. And that's, that's how I believe. And I think correct living and learning about macrobiotics from the Eastern philosophy has saved my life. And, and yeah. My friend Armando is a staunch vegan and I was there on the weekend and every time I'm with him, I just respect them and I eat vegan. And it's not bad. It tastes pretty good. And he said, no, no, that's what you said. You can have your eggs and your fish and meat in front of you. And I say, no, I choose not to. So I'll eat vegan when I'm around him. I don't mind it. Yeah, it doesn't bother me if someone sits next to me and orders a steak. And he's like, I'm not. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I didn't stop eating meat because people were killing animals. Sorry, that wasn't the reason I stopped. Mm -hmm. I stopped because I didn't want to have the meat inside my body. And, uh, and it's great that then they're not killing an animal for me to eat. That's a wonderful side effect, but that's not why I stopped. It wasn't to save the animals. It was to save my health. <laughs> so are you more like an activist, like Paul McCartney and his veganism, and then you have Chrissy Hind, who's an activist? I'm about to, I'm about to launch into that, actually, I, at my age and the things that I've been through and what I've created with my Correct Living Company and... Mm -hmm. I truly believe it's a message, especially now with the with the with the pandemic uh, exposing people to really what's going on. That I think that people are yearning for new information, and it's been here all along. It's just that the mainstream media, the MSM, they push what they push, and you know the manufacturers that make those wonderful foods that are bright colored and pretty packaged uh, that everybody wants to buy. The commercials on TV that they have, right? Skittles and all those wonderful, fun things. Um, that's how they make money. But uh, it's not about money. It's about health. And I think people need to take responsibility for their own health, really, truly. It's, you know, to blame it on someone else, not when you're an adult. Yeah, I sometimes think they want to kill us because it's just those big FDA people that just want to make the money. They don't. They want to keep you sick, basically. Yes. And okay. Here, I heard something. Take take this. Exactly that. It's not. It's not health care. It's sick care, right? <laughs> so look at it. Look look at a hotel. Let's say I own a hotel and my hotel has nine hundred beds in it, mm -hmm. four hundred rooms, nine hundred beds. Now, to, for me to make money as a business owner, I want every bed full. Right. I want to rent those hotel rooms out. I mean, well, well, uh, what is a hospital but a big building with rooms and beds? Mm -hmm. So what do they want to do? They want the beds full. What does that mean? Sick people. Yeah. You see, they, the hospital doesn't make money if it sits empty. So all those beds need to be full. And I'm going to tell you right now, I have never said this publicly, but I'm, it's going to be one of the first podcasts that I do on Tony Hudson Talks, which I'm about wow. to launch. But <laughs> I'm going to, it, it's, it's on the topic of mammogram. I've never had a mammogram, never believed in it, never got fear mongered into thinking I had to get one. I never believed in putting my body in front of all that. I mean, what do they put on you but an iron apron when you get a, a x-ray for your tooth? And now they want you to just to just offer your body up to all this radiation and stuff. And, you're the, and what is what is the apron that they put on you when you get an X-ray made of lead? What used to be in our paint? Lead. lead. It would protect us from radiation if we have lead paint in our house. But if we don't have lead paint, what can they do? Penetrate our living space. You see. So there's always an ulterior motive, but we just didn't know it because we only listen to the mainstream media and the mainstream media is bought by the same people that make the farming and the food and the thing. So it's all owned by the same people. We're going to get the same narrative. So we've got to look for alternative sources and we've got to be proactive in making our own responsible choices. I totally agree about that, Tony. So tell me about the Harry and son, you and Tom Cruise auditioned together for a movie. 
which Paul yes. Newman directed and starred. Tell us oh, about that one. That's such a fun story. I'm so glad you asked. Oh, that's in the trivia, isn't it, on my IMDb? Um, so I was probably 21. 20, no. Yeah. I was young. And I had a fourth callback for a movie. It was Lynn Stallmaster Casting Office. He's very famous, a gentleman. If you were to look him up, you'd see all the famous movies that he cast. But he's casting this movie, and Paul Newman is the director and the star of the movie. And so Lynn Stallmaster brought me in for my fourth call back to read for Paul. And Joanne Woodward, his wife, was there. She was in the corner doing needlepoint. Wow. And so Saturday, I went into the big high-rise office in uh, Beverly Hills, and there was no one in there. I'd never been there on a weekend for an audition. It was very strange. So I'm sitting there thinking I've got the wrong day or the wrong place. There's not a soul in sight. I'm sitting in the waiting area. And finally, this little lady comes out, Tony Howard, now a big agent. But back then, she was Lynn Stallmaster's casting assistant. And she said, are you ready to read? And I went, oh, okay. So just was walked right in and there's Paul had about a five mm. minute conversation with him. And then that he asked me to read, I read with Lynn and they said, thank you very much. After it's like nine page, very dramatic scene between the girl and the boyfriend, which the boyfriend is playing his son in the movie. And so they asked, they said, thank you. And I left. And as I left, there was this guy sitting in the waiting room like I was earlier by himself. Wow. And so as an actor, I look at him and I nod and like, hey, good luck, you know, and I leave and I go down the hall to the elevators and then Tony Howard opens the door and goes, Tony, come back. And she says, would you do us a favor and read again with this actor that we brought in from New York? And so I go back into the waiting room and she says, Tony, this is Tom. Tom, this is Tony. I, I'm like, okay, no rehearsal, no preparation. We both walked in there, proceeded to read this eight-page dramatic scene there wasn't a dry eye in the room everybody's crying we ended the scene forehead to forehead wow and this actor tom guy leans into my ear and he goes you read better than anybody i read with in new york like whispered that in my ear and then we ended up chatting with paul for like a minute afterwards and he said thank you and we both left and we were jacked out of our minds as these young actors who just read for Paul Newman. And, and when we read together, Joanne Woodward stopped doing her needlepoint and was watching our scene. And she was crying, wow. too. And so as two actors, so excited about the experience we just had, we walked across the street together. You want to have coffee? Let's just, oh, my God, you know. So we go across to Love's Barbecue Pit. And we had coffee for four hours. Two actors wow. just talking about our careers and now, here's where Tom's career was. Taps had come out, so he had already done Taps and it had come out. And then he had shot Risky Business, but it had not come out yet. It was in the can. So when I met him doing this audition, he was just an up-and-coming actor. He wasn't Tom Cruise yet. So we had this wonderful experience, four-hour coffee, just amazing, and we said goodbye, and neither of us got the movie. No, We didn't get hired, and we're like, Oh, and then we find out because I, two weeks later, was at the uh, commissary at the studios where I auditioned, and I'm having lunch by myself after I had a different audition. And Tony Howard, the assistant to Lynn Stallmaster, was having lunch in the commissary. She walked over to my table with her lunch date, this other lady, introduced the lady to me as Tony, this amazing actress. I, I just have to tell you, and she looks at me and she goes, Tony, you came and she put her fingers as close together as she could without touching. She goes, you came this close to getting that part. And we told him he made a big mistake by not hiring you. Wow. And found out that Ellen Barkin, who had just come off the movie Diner, mm -hmm. and Robbie Benson, who was a very working actor, seasoned actor, and Paul Newman, being a director for this movie, Harry and Son, was insecure about two new actors, Tony and Tom, so he went with Robbie and Ellen. The movie didn't do so well, but that was my Harry and Son Tom Cruise experience. But I have a tag to that. 30 years later, Tom Cruise, of course, goes on to be Tom Cruise. I never run into him again. In person, never see him. 
Wow. Paul, Newman, Paul Newman dies. People magazine gives Tom Cruise a page to talk about his relationship with Paul Newman. And he mentions the Harry and Son audition. And that was with me. <laughs> and he comes 30 years later to rehearse at the Oscars to present for best picture. Mm. Because he's, he's going to deliver that award. I'm working the Oscars. And I'm sitting in the seat, pretend Kathleen Kennedy, who produced War Horse with Steven Spielberg, so wow. that we have people for him to interact with while he's rehearsing. So Tom Cruise says, for rehearsal purposes only, the Oscar goes to War Horse, Kathleen Kennedy, Steven. So I go up and Tom is handing me an Oscar on the Oscar stage for rehearsal. And he looks at me and he goes, wait, how do I know? Wait, you look. And I'm like, you and me, Harry and Sings, oh my God. So now we're rehearsing the Oscars live with the directors and the producers in the truck. But we're talking Harry and Son on stage. It was, it was wild. And it was really, it was really a kind of a surreal moment to come circle back around. And he was who he is now. And there I am still, you know, in the business working. But yeah. Yeah. A little bit of fact, you probably know, it's not, it was uh, Tom Mopather. And then I think he took his mother's main name, Cruz, I think. Mm -hmm. And his brother's an actor, but uses Mopother. So you never think that they're brothers until, you know. Exactly. Like, exactly. So it's kind of interesting. And yeah, that's an amazing story of Paul Newman. So of what it was like <laughs> to be in his presence. You know, I was so nervous as an actor. It was really hard to take in his presence as much as I was trying to maintain my own. <laughs> 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 but you were actually auditioning in a movie with Tom Cruise. I mean, I mean, back then, but Tom Cruise. <laughs> oh, no, it, you know, um, seriously. I mean, I'm, I'm a big, I'm a longtime person in this industry, you know, over 40 years. So, yeah, I mean, I worked with Sally Fields and Danny Glover and John Malkovich. And, you know, I mean, there's just, it's just, it's just the talent. Yeah. Wow. So rich, so rich. How do, how do you feel that your acting and your experience in life has evolved from the early days when you first started acting to now? How has it evolved? I would say, uh, well, I obviously play different character now. So when I was younger and working a lot, I was just the typical blonde young, you know, either the teenager or the young 20 something, which is the bulk of my career, the big bulk of it. Uh, and then the motherhood time took me away in and out of it in my 30s and 40s. So now coming back, I'm playing women. I'm playing, you know, grown, grown ass women who have lives and full on backstories. So it's a little more rich. You know, I used to be 20 and playing a 16 year old. That was tough because I'm 20 mm -hmm. becoming a woman. I'm going, hey, there's Johnny at the mall. You know, it wasn't so fulfilling. So now as a woman, the character is more complex. And I'm, write, I'm writing a film right now called Living on the Fringe, which is my story of, yeah, of recovery, of recovery of abuse and childhood. And, but I made the character go through it. So I'm using my life to write a really great film called Living on the Fringe. And so I, I, I take my acting experience now and create my own work. Are you recognized in public? Sometimes, yes. Very rarely, but sometimes. Yeah. And how many people say that, hey, you're Ho Tony Hudson, you were in that movie, or hey, you look familiar. It's occasional. It's really not so much. Sometimes people just really see it, see it easily. Uh, but, you know, I don't, I don't push it that much. I don't even talk about it unless I get asked about it or something, you know. Yeah, you were mentioning about your podcast you want to start, Tony Talks. What's the motivation behind that, and what will be the niche for that one? Everything you and I talked about today. I mean, I want to share correct living with more than the people that I get to interact with one-on-one -on -one when they're my client and I'm helping them. I'd like to ha actually have more people understand what it is so that they can take their lives into their own hands and not be so fearful. And that's the biggest. And then, of course, all the Hollywood stories. I have so mm -hmm. many. That's just one story, the Tom Cruise story. I have so many stories. And they're interesting. You know, how, how the industry works, how I booked a movie. or 
and then the people that were involved. And so, yeah, there'll be different facets of it. There'll be the health eating, correct living side. There'll be the Hollywood side. And then there'll be the just womanhood, dating, life, inspirational, motivational. Because I come from dysfunction. I'm not, yes, tender love. I, I come from dysfunction in reference to my personal growth of chill, you know, being a child and growing up. But I quickly, at 16, 17, 18, 19, went into therapy, tried, started working on myself really early on, and then changed my eating in 1920. So I, I've been alternative for a very long time. Who was your favorite actor and actress back then when you were 19 and 20 years old? I really liked Jessica Lange. Mm. Of course, Meryl Streep and her iconic history of roles. Um, you know, I, I auditioned for Pretty Woman. Julia Roberts is a semi-friend, acquaintance friend. Mm. Uh, yeah, it was, yeah. I, I, I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. What was your most challenging role so far and why? I think the challenge, most challenging was Charlie's Christmas Wish, carrying all those hats, being a producer, the dog handler, the lead actor, the mother to the lead actor kid in the movie and in real life, <laughs> Doing, staying up till two in the morning, setting up the living room for the shoot the next day, then going and having to do the office the next day, you know, doing all the different acts. That was the most challenging and not having produced a film before, you know, wondering if you can, if we can. And then of course, Lionsgate distributed. So we got distributed really awesome. And uh, so first time out of the gate. So I, I really want to move into producing and directing as well. Well, you could probably do it and, and actually, uh, you know, be successful in that. How did you handle the romantic roles, like the kissing and the hugging? How, how was that performed to make it real? But at the same time, you weren't kind of, you know, <laughs> what would you say? <laughs> Cheating on your husband or whoever you're dating at that point in the Tinder book. Right. Well, I mean, many people have been asked this question that are actors in reference to there's so many people on set. It would be, you know, think about going on a date and just pretend like you start making out and getting intimate at a dinner table at the whole restaurant's looking at you. How intimate can you really get, right? So you mm -hmm. have to kind of block out all the, the crew, the grips, the lighting people, the makeup and hair people standing by. Pro focus on the character and their intent in the scene. Deliver it believable. And if that's kissing and touching... That's just the that's just the courage of a of an actor of a of a creative I guess you know and and uh, being an actor Dirk understood it uh, Judd understood it only because it was and it didn't happen often with me where there was a lot of kissing but enough <laughs> I don't know I, my wife was an actress and she had to do that I'm thinking well you know should I start the divorce procedures because you know. <laughs> he might be more attracted to me or <laughs> go for but him. It, tr it truly is more of a generic and you're, and you're, and you're actually, you're, you're doing it through the character. So if I'm playing a, a girl named Rita, who, you know, it's not Tony kissing the guy, even though it is me, mm -hmm. but I'm in this, I'm scared, let's say, and he's protecting me and now we're close and he's, and then we end up kissing. It's that moment of Rita even though, yes, it is me. And, and a lot of character, a lot of actors do carry it past cut <laughs> in their personal life. And then, and then all hell breaks loose. <laughs> well, what if you suddenly woke up in the morning and you were, were one of your characters over the years in the movie forever? Would it be Julie Collins from Prime Risk? Denise from Just One of the Guys? Rita from School Spirit? Which one would you want to be for the rest of your life? It would probably be Denise. Denise from Just One of the Guys, if I had to choose between those three. And uh, it's because, she, you know, she had a mind of her own. She's a little spunky. A little <laughs> spunky girl. I liked Denise. And, from, and Prime Risk, um, that was, I liked her too because her, her character, uh, she was strong. She was a strong character. Mm-hmm. 
I, I don't suppose that Texas Chainsaw didn't give you like nightmares or affect your life somehow. I know it's just a movie, but still, I mean. Yeah, no, that was really fun to shoot. That, that um, was super, super fun to shoot. Yes. And uh, Ken, the, the African-American actor who's in the scenes with me a lot. Cause he's a, he's like a, a weekend a soldier guy and he mm -hmm. comes along and we kind of hook up for a minute, not hook up his relationship, but team up running away from Leatherface. Um, yeah. And, and, but Ken Foray, that's his name. Great actor, but great. It, that, it was, I liked that character a lot cause I got to play crazy. I got to be somebody who was lost in the woods for 10 days that has holes in her hands cause she was nailed to the chair that Leatherface was going to eat. And then I got away and they, and I had to watch them eat my sister. So I'm like freaked out. I, I get, so I got to just let loose in that. It was liberating. Yeah. You were talking about how you didn't get the role when you were doing the Paul Newman one. Why? <laughs> you said so good. Like, why didn't you get the role? No, truly. Uh, and Tony Howard telling me that, I know it had to be true. She wouldn't have come all the way over to my table to tell me that story. Um, wow. and, and I truly think it was because we were, we were novices. Tony and Tom were novices. And Robbie Benson was seasoned, oh, been around a long time. But I also mm -hmm. think it made it harder to believe that he was Paul Newman's son in the movie because everybody knew, oh, that's Paul Newman and Robbie Benson. Right. If it was Tom Cruise, they did, they would think, oh, it's Paul Newman's son because it's believable. They didn't know Tom Cruise yet. But yeah, it was his insecurity about just directing. He was directing, see, not just acting. And he wanted to direct seasoned talent to make his job easier. And he thought we might have make it more difficult, possibly. What script are you learning now? What movie's coming out that you're going to be huh? able to balance it with Tony Talks? <laughs> I'm actually getting ready to shoot in October in, in New York a movie called Slash Squatch. It's a, a horror film of like a, <laughs> like a Bigfoot, a killer Bigfoot. Really? Yes. Wow. And I get to play Dawn. I play Dawn, who is an 80s uh, actor, singer, and uh, now she lives in a small town. She was a big thing when she came to town, and now she owns the bar and the hardware store. And yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a really uh, interesting little horror flick because it's got some humanity to the characters. And then of course he just goes and kills everybody. <laughs> Is there any good advice you would give to an up and coming Tony Hudson and, and Dirk Benedicts out there who want to get into movies? What would you tell them? I would say, believe it before you see it. So, in other words, if you want to be an actor, start acting and do everything you can to move towards it. And don't let anybody tell you that it's not possible because it is a real profession and you can do it for the rest of your life. Right. So there's no age limit to acting. And if it's who you are, then it's 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 very fulfilling. And I would just say, go after it. Don't let somebody talk you out of it. Is the Sasquatch role something you wanted or you were forced into? I mean, like, why? I'm just asking. I'm just curious. Uh, no, the part was written for me. The director, Aaron Bratcher, wrote oh, wow. the part for me. He was a fan of my work. He saw Prime mm. Risk. He loved me in Prime Risk. Nice. That Julie, that Julie Collins. He said, oh, I love that Julie Collins. You're just so spunky and unafraid. And so he goes, I wanted you in my movie. So he reached out to me, much as you did. Uh, I've had a couple of meetings with him. I'm even trying to possibly produce it with him, helping him raise some money. Um, so, yeah, any way I can. Well, I thank you very much for actually connecting with me. And I'm so glad I was able to bring you on the podcast. Uh, do you feel that the film industry has changed? Because now back when you were starting, especially with Tom Mopother, Tom Cruise, um, you had to go in to do auditions now they have self-tapes is that still true for you or do you still prefer to go in and do an, a live audition well i definitely prefer to go in live audition and i i do not like self-taping at all i i give good audition in the room much better mm -hmm. than i self-tape but that's where it's moved to the self-tape there's still some people going in now now they're starting to go back in sometimes in physical form 
but uh, it's both now. They use both formats. What makes you so passionate about your um, acting? Like why, like for instance, you're so passionate that you wrote a book called Racquetball for Women. Like what inspired you to do that? Why do you, what inspires you to do all these things? You can just wake up tomorrow morning and say, hey, I have a song I want to sing. I want to write a song, and get, you know. Well, I do have an album of songs already. <laughs> <laughs> I do actually, a whole album called Cowgirl Lost. Um, what, you know, I've, I've realized that I, a way to express my pain, my angst, my hurt, my growth, my, my journey is through my art. So I express my challenges through art, whether I write about it, sing about it, right? It's, it's how I get through it, is share it. It's my therapy. It's very cathartic. And I think I'm not alone in that. So I... I believe that if I can take something true that's happened in my life, write about it, and it can help someone, why not? So do you think your current Bowie with now is going to end up being your fourth husband? Oh, I don't know. We're enjoying, <laughs> we're enjoying ourselves very much. His name is David. And, David. And he's amazing. We're enjoying getting together at this age. You know, we're not getting together to start a family like you do when you're younger. And so it's mm -hmm. just a, it's a different way of coming together. And uh, we have a lot of history uh, individually. So blending blending our families and our life, it's it's actually quite beautiful. He's an he's an amazing man, actually. Is it true that you had a child at 44? Yes, my last child who just turned 19, I had him at 44. Yeah, because my mother had me when she was 45. There you go. See? Living oh, proof. It is possible. It is possible. Yes. yes. So all you girls out there that think it's too late, it's not. Especially if you're eating healthy. You can have kids all the way into your 50s. That's excellent. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And sorry that took so long to bring you on, but I really enjoyed the conversation interview. What are the last words to people out there who um, – need some a little bit of help in their health or eating habits or acting what can you give them I don't know. um i guess i would say to follow your passion and some people don't know what their passion is but if you listen to your heart and what makes you feel good i think people don't do that enough they try to follow the rules. They try to be responsible, to fit into molds that parents and uh, elders try to put them in, or fear keeps them from trying things. I think being brave and uh, bold. I mean, I, I love a quote that, uh, oh, gosh, I'm, right when I want to say the quote, it just left me. Sorry, it just left me. But... Um, yeah, I think just taking your life into your own hands and being responsible and not, you know, when we point the finger, that's one finger. How many else are pointing back at me? Right? That's true. Three. Three. Yeah, exactly. So wow. It's, so, so it's up to me and it's up to you and it's up to us to look in the mirror and to say, yes, I'm good. I'm okay. And I can get better. And it's just whatever your journey is to focus on and go for it. Just don't let someone take it away from you. That's all I got to say. Wow, that's a great thing of advice. I really appreciate that. Wait right there, Tony. Okay, everyone, we are going to end this stream. Really appreciate actress Tony Hudson, the one and only actress Tony Hudson, to be on our podcast. And we learned so much about you and about eating habits. And I'm definitely going to find out that, that rice because that's something I may need to help me out. Joel, just and, go get my audio book, How I Found Myself with Correct Living. It's a two and a half hour listen. It'll it'll get you, yeah. And this book here as well. <laughs> Tinder Love. <laughs> Your favorite. <laughs> yes. Tinder Love. Love it. Love it. Okay, everyone, I'm gonna end the stream with Tony Hudson. Thanks, Tony. Wait right there. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.